Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with a re-review. This is really fun to do because, first of all, because I have you to talk to directly and ClassicsToday.com, I can actually listen to things like more frequently than I otherwise might. And I really, really think this is a good, healthy thing, especially as I get older, to, to know that something that I despised or loved, I still despise or love, even if not for entirely the same reasons. But this is one of those recordings that I listened to. I thought it was just terrific. And I put it aside and haven't listened to it in a long time. And I picked it up again because, because of you folk, because we did the list of the 10 greatest living conductors. And one of those people was Vladimir Yurovsky, who you all seem to agree with, which I made me feel wonderful. It really did. And it was someone, one of you mentioned his Mahler. And I had listened to his Mahler. I reviewed all of his Mahler that I had, um, Symphonies 1, 2, and 4. And number one was, eh, you know, number two was terrific. And four was maybe the best of all. It was really, really excellent. And so I whipped out number four again and put it on just to see if I was, you know, blowing smoke or I really knew or think I knew what I was talking about. And sure enough, it's terrific. It's really, really terrific. This is a great Mahler 4. The only thing that I had a problem with was the fact that the, the trumpets at the climax of the Adagio are kind of like far back. They need to be more brilliant and ring out over the orchestra a little bit more. But other than that, I mean, the guy doesn't put a foot wrong. It's just a marvelous, marvelous performance. I wish I had been there because the sonics are a little dry, you know. It would have been it would have been sort of wonderful to hear how it actually sounded on the day. But I mean, just if you just look at the timings, which I know, I know, I know, timings, right? Especially in Mahler with all the changes of tempo, you know, internally. But still, it's just right. The whole performance takes 58 minutes and 55 seconds. It's 17 minutes and 51 seconds for the first movement, 10 minutes for the scherzo, 21 minutes and 20 seconds for the adagio, and 9 minutes and 36 seconds for the finale. That is just about ideal. I mean, it really is. I mean, in terms of proportion and also in terms of the duration of each movement, you can go quicker. Going slower is a little problematic. It's just about right. It's, it's quite wonderful. And because there's so much internal contrast, it's really quite exciting. Um, it really, really is. And I want to show you, I want to show you something. I want to show you something that's really kind of meaningful as an example of, you know, why uh, conductors are necessary and what they can or should do and how you can tell if they know how to conduct. You know, it's not as much of a mystery as they would want us to believe and as the world would have us to believe. You just have to find the right piece of music. The one that can really show up whether the guy is either either focused on what the composer wrote or knows how to do what the composer wrote. And here is a case in point. I'm going to put up a piece of music. This is the end of the exposition of the first movement. That's the score. Now, if you look at what Mahler writes, you can see there are two systems. You see like the little, the two little like railroad tracks there in the middle of the page. So that divides the page into two bits. And the top system, you can see the orchestration there. It's four flutes, two oboes, English horn, two clarinets, three bassoons, uh, four horns, and strings. That's what's, that's what's playing in this passage. And if you know the symphony, then you know the moment in question. It's the one where the, the woodwinds are going, da-da-dum, bum, bum, ba-da-dum, bum, bum, ba-da-da, da-da-da, da-da-da, da-da-da. It's that business. And... They're whipping along on the top, as you can see, and then you'll see the words etvas island. That means somewhat hurrying. So they're going, you know, da 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 and then all of a sudden, quicker, right? With no warning and just for one bar. And then, and then see the, the, the apostrophe at the end, at the end of that page, right after Etvas Island, you see all the systems have an apostrophe. That is what we call in the music business a Luftpause or a air breath pause, a breath pause, a just very brief pause, but it's of indeterminate length. 
You don't know how long you could stop for a second. You could stop for a half a second. You could stop for a microsecond. Theoretically, you could stop for a minute and a half. I know you couldn't because it's a breath pause. It just means a brief little hesitation. And then the next mo bo 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 number, you see there on number five, number five down there below, it says wieder gemächlich, which means once again leisurely. So after that hurrying, you're going back to the speed that it was before, which has already changed, by the way. It's already much slower from what it just was. So, I mean, there are all these changes of tempo, sudden pauses and hesitations, and there is no way in hell, no way in hell that a, a genuine, um, like, orchestra that thinks it knows better could do this without a conductor. Because they're simply executive, oh, let me take this down so I can talk to you. Wait a minute. Here we go. There are just too many executive decisions that need to be made. You know, how much quicker is quicker? How long do you make that pause for? How much slower is slower? And you want to make it all convincing. You want to observe all these things without losing the long line of musical discourse. You know, it should all sound somehow like it all fits together, that these are just, it's like raising my voice in the middle of a sentence or speeding up and slowing down a little bit in the middle, you know, during the course of a sentence. You want it to still be a sentence, but you don't, but you want it to have variety. You want it to have character. All of those things, you know, depend on the conductor. And the fact of the matter is that Yurovsky here does it all. He does it marvelously. He does it as well as anybody has ever done it. And that's just one of those moments that I listen for um, when I hear performances of Mahler 4. Now, some conductors just ignore what Mahler wrote. Some of them just keep the tempo steady no matter what. Some people ignore the pause. They just go straight through. You know, they, they, they don't pay any attention whatsoever. And that what that means is either they're not paying attention for what that's worth, you can decide whether you like their ideas better than Mahler's ideas, or they just don't know how. In other words, they can't. Technically, they have an issue with, with doing it the way that Mahler wants you to do it. And there are countless examples of that sort of thing in Mahler symphonies, I mean, because they are conductor's music. I mean, they require a virtuoso podium technique to bring them off. And this performance just does it splendidly. And the other big advantage it has, which I think is considerable, is that the, the soloist, the Sophia Fomina, the soprano, is first class. I mean, this, this finale is always a problem. It's always a problem because it's not really like a major soprano role. And when, you know, performers do it, they like find, you know, it's like they sort of like look them up in the phone book or maybe on Craigslist, you know, wanted soprano, Mahler 4, come sing it. And it, the, the performances that have really great sopranos are relatively few and far between. You know, there was, there was Rary Grist for Bernstein. There's Kathleen Battle for Mazel. There's Natanya Davreth, who's the best of all for Bravenel. And she's right up there. She's absolutely right up there. Sophia Fomina does a magnificent job with the finale in capturing its purity, its innocence, its dreamlike quality at the end. It's just marvelous, marvelous singing and playing. And so, once again, I recommend this Mahler 4 wholeheartedly if you haven't heard it and you're a Mahler person and you like the fourth particularly and you, you, you know, Yurovsky and the London Phil are not the usual Mahler culprits. And I think that's a great thing. And I hope they never do a cycle. I really do. Because I already know that their first is going to suck. So, you know, maybe they can do more, you know, or Yarowski can do more with a different orchestra. I don't know. Whatever's going to happen is going to happen, obviously. But it's just nice to know that these singleton performances are out there. And some of them are absolutely superb. So do give it a shot. And let me know what you think. Keep on listening, friends. Thanks for joining me. Take care.